she is fresh off being part of the broadcast team for the American Athletic Conference Championship. It is the great Chris Budden, a ESPN reporter extraordinaire. She's also worked at Fox, all sorts of other platforms, and her resume is very long. And we're going to tell her story today. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. Chris, I think we met about seven was it eight years ago up in Seattle through through Dick Emberg? And I just knew when I met you that you had stardom in your future. So I really appreciate this opportunity to tell your story. And I want to start here. The reaction on television that one of your children, Jace and Landon, either one, have seen when you're on television, what is it? a charming thing that you've noticed or heard that they have reacted in a certain way when seeing you on TV? You know, my daughter hasn't quite gotten it yet because she's two, but my five-year-old Jace, it probably started about two years ago. My husband will always have the game on whenever I'm on TV. And it's not like he tells my son, like, watch out for mom, but I'll just like kind of pop out out of nowhere because that's how our reports happen. And it'll be like, mommy, mommy, hi, mommy, hi, mommy. <laughs> so now he understands that he can't really talk to me through the TV. At three years old, he thought he could. So it was like, Hi, mommy. Why aren't you talking back to me, mommy? Hi, mommy. <laughs> but it's really cool because my husband will record that and like send it to me when I'm on the road, when I miss them. So that's been cool. I'm wondering at what point, like, does he realize that everyone's mom isn't on TV? And <laughs> that's really kind of an abnormal thing. <laughs> but he thinks it's fun now. How does your son inspire you by what he's overcome? And I'm certainly, I've been very moved by your Instagram posts and your tributes to him and all that he's overcome. Yeah, so he um, has dealt uh, since he was little, just we always knew he was a little bit behind of things. Um, and so he deals with sensory issues. And, and honestly, the pandemic was a time that allowed me to be at home and allowed us to work on it. You know, he was my firstborn. So you, you don't really know, like, should he be able to hold a pen like this? Should he be able to, you, you don't know what milestones are just things that he should be doing. And when is the time that we should really be working on it? And when the world shut down a year ago, I was like, you know, now's the time that I am in town and we can work on these things. And like the growth that he's taken in the last year, because I've been able to spend that time focusing on with him, um he's come he's just come so far in the past year and things that that you know that that are easy for some kids just take him a little harder and a little longer to learn how much of yourself do you see in your daughter a lot it's funny my i my son is a miniature uh mario my husband <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter is me and it's weird um, just her, you, you know, even at two years old, her tenacity, her spunk, her like, I, you know, my son will try something and if it's too hard, he'll stop. Like my daughter, like does it until like, until she does it. Uh, and those were qualities that I have had still always have. Um, and, and so it is, it is weird how just like one is so much like my husband and one is so oh. much like me. How has motherhood lent itself to you being a better storyteller? Um, I, immensely. I mean, like, I have shared that I hid my first pregnancy with Jace because I thought, oh, like being a mom makes me old. And, you know, I had this perception that women on TV had to be young and beautiful. And when you're pregnant, you feel anything but that. And then I realized, A, I have a better connection now with the coaches and professional players that I cover because they have families. So now we have this, hey, how is your family doing? We start to be able to have more common ground. I've had coaches, Shaka Smart came up to me during a halftime interview. I'm like, okay, we're 30 seconds away. And he's like, how's your daughter doing? And I'm Aww. like, that, that's good. I'm standby. <laughs> uh, but you have that now more. And, and the more you share, the more that they get to see parts of, of your personal life. I also think it's made me very aware of um, 
understanding other people's emotions, um, understanding not what it would be like to lose a child, but like understanding when I'm telling stories like that, the gravity of it. I've shared that in Omaha in the College World Series in 2019, um, probably the the heaviest, the best and the heaviest event I've covered because there was supposed to be a player on that team who would have been a senior. His name was Donnie Everett, uh, passed away his freshman year. And Donnie's parents came to Omaha and Vanderbilt went out and won the national championship. And the Everett celebrated on the field with them. Wow. And I'm sitting here like I was on the field getting choked up. And because I have kids, I can, I just feel like I'm better to understand what that meant for them. If I didn't have the love of a child, I don't know if I could have grasped their story as well as I did. Oh, absolutely. And ESPN's Chris Budden is with us. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. It's that empathy that that you have and you, you've developed and even grown more a, as a mother for sure. And you got... Matt, speaking of getting choked up, you got Matt Campbell choked up in an interview when you were interviewing the Iowa State head football coach not long ago. Do you remember that and, and, and what that was like in, in that experience? Because perhaps it caught you off guard because you asked him a question and all of a sudden emotions came and they came. They were just explosive in a way. Yeah. And I don't, I, I, first of all, I wouldn't say I made him emotional. Yeah. I think the interviewer can take you down a path and they can keep you in that emotion, which was really my job once he got there. It was surprising because a like 15 minutes had gone by between the end of the game. And when I had interviewed him because of all the protocols that we have now, and it was really just a simple question. It wasn't even something that was meant to take him there. And then he did. And then you're like, wow, like this isn't a guy who I've really seen get to that point before in an interview. Uh, and so it was shocking. And at that point, it was just like, let's keep him here in the moment. And you want to do it in a way that's like gentle, not exploiting, um, but that allows him to process the emotion. So that's always kind of a delicate balance. There's always the weird part of like, you, you know, you don't want to interrupt. And if there's an awkward silence, like, that's okay. So you just, you just have to let that silence be. And that's sometimes the hardest thing about interviewing people that are emotional is like the empathetic part of me wants to write, reach out and give them a yeah. hug. Hey, we can't hug right now. And be like, that's sometimes the best parts of the interview or just letting it breathe and letting that kind of silence fill. The, the perception that you've noticed since opening up in 2015 that you hit your pregnancy like you said the coaches many of them have been very supportive of you internally for you where are you as far as being okay with that it's been six years or so since that post how far along are you in coming to terms with yourself through all that yeah oh my gosh light years uh i think it was more insecurity than it was anything else and and, it, and what i find most disappointing it was to think that I got to where I was with the Padres or at the time with Fox and then ESPN because I was young or pretty or whatever, and not that it was talent-based. Exactly. And yeah. I hate that I disvalued that. Cause then once I had my daughter, like I was very open about being pregnant. And cause at that point I knew that I belonged. And I don't know if I had the self-confidence then at 30 years old, than I do now at now I'm 37. Um, so I think I've come a long way. I think society has come a ways. We're not all the way there yet, but in terms of you see more of it now. I mean, like I do a podcast with Molly McGrath and Allison Williams. You know, we all have kids, we all talk about it. And so seeing more women on TV, older, pregnant, having families, it makes you kind of feel like it, now it's like, cool. Cause there's like a certain, you know, there's a group of us and we text and we congratulate. And now I'm part of a different club. And, but, but all of that, I, I would all say that it's because we've grown in our self-confidence. No question. And having that support system has to be crucial as well. Your dad had a handwritten note, a speech that he did during your wedding. And he <laughs> listed out, all of these different characteristics about what makes you special. 
How many of those still apply to you today or describe who you are today? And, and what stands out from that moving speech from your father? Well, it was only seven years. <laughs> I've been married that long, so hopefully things haven't changed too much in seven years. I would say I'm a lot of the same person when I was younger. Um, maybe I've just taken those qualities and they've all strengthened a little bit more. I definitely have way more self-confidence than I used to. And part of it is probably like just having to grow a backbone with growing up in the age of social media. Sure. Um, I remember a story with my father um, who was always like, he, he was like that tough dad, you know, like in sports, it was like, you're going to do that. You know, like he wasn't one to just let me walk away from, from things. And I was at uh, university of Missouri in the broadcast school. And I came home from Christmas one day and I overheard my parents talking and my dad's like, I don't know if she's cut out to do this. And I didn't know why he said it. And he didn't know I heard him say it. And I took that for years and I was like, I'm going to prove him wrong. And like two years ago, I asked him like why he said that and what he meant by that. And I thought in my head, it was a talent thing. And he was like, no, no, no. He's like, I always knew you had the talent. I just didn't know if you'd be cut out for being, you know, this was 2006 of mm -hmm. being a female in a man's world. He's, I didn't know if you would be okay taking that kind of criticism. And as a father, you know, we'd like you to have the easiest path possible and not have to deal with all that. Uh, so that's probably where I've grown the most, being able to, to take the criticism. Sometimes it's fair, sometimes it's not. Being able to ignore the stuff that's not uh, the fair criticism. How much those words of your father play into your drive? Like you said, proving people wrong. When you look at your work ethic, where does that come from? It comes from my family. I mean, both my parents worked. Um, I always knew even after I had kids that I wanted to work. You know, part of it's my own mental health. Um, and I've always been that way. I mean, my mom will tell you, like, if I, she said the sky was blue, I would argue and say, no, it's purple. Like, it's just, I just, I have always been this headstrong person. And I knew since I was 12 that this was the path that I wanted to do. I didn't know if it would be news or sports. I knew I wanted to be a reporter. And uh, down the road, I ended up picking sports. So I'm kind of one of those people that, like, once I have my mindset on something, I just, you know, that that becomes the path. Um, and when there's roadblocks in the way, then you find another way to go down the path. And that's something that my parents instilled in me very young. Um, you know, my parents didn't grow up with a ton of money. They have a great story of their first dining room table was like a wooden spool that was in wow. down on a farm. And they took that and that was their dining room table for like the next 15 years. It was a symbol of like where they came from. And my parents have always instilled that in me um, since I was a young girl. Speaking of where you came from, as far as your TV background, Charlottesville, Knoxville, some of your earlier stops in the local TV game. Certainly, I've done some of the local TV. It's a grind, as you know. What were some of the more humbling experiences for you? during the early days of your come up in the business? Yeah, I think both stations that I was at, I was the, at the, when I started, I was the only female in sports at the time. Um, and then the other stations grew to have other women. Uh, but when I got to Knoxville, my first couple months were a little rough. So I get there and I start covering spring training for Tennessee and our web people wanted to do some kind of like fun stuff with the athletes. And they said, Chris, why don't you go interview the athletes, ask them what their favorite food is, ask them the hardest they've ever been hit, ask them really all these fluffy kind of questions. Sure. And at the time I was so like, I have to, I'm the only female here. I have to make this impression of th that I'm this hard hitting journalist. And so I refused to do it. And they got my station got mad at me and they basically were like, well, we'll give you an assignment. You have to do it. And I tried explaining to them, like, this is my first impression coming up and being like, what's your favorite food to me is not the best way to make a first impression. 
And they said, well, they, they don't look at you like you're the only female here. And I'm like, you can't say that because you're not in my shoes. Now, like the things that I ask players, I'm like, what's your lock screen on your phone? Because you get really great answers. Yeah. Again, like, I'm way more self-confident. Um, then like the second month I was at Knoxville, I was doing uh, highlights of the Kentucky Derby and a horse, eight bells. I still remember it. She went down and she had to be euthanized. Mm. And I didn't have my scripts with me because we were running onto the set. And I said, of euthanized, I said, immunized. And so then there were all these blogs and these like message boards. It was like, thank goodness, Chris Button prevented the horse from getting chicken pox. And so it was just, uh, you know, you make some blunders, but I, like, that's why you take the route that you do, you know? Absolutely. I don't start at ESPN at 23 years old because you're bound to make some mistakes, especially in today's viral world one mistake like that on a big stage can really ruin your career. Thankfully, I made it in front of, you know, Knoxville and Charlottesville, Virginia, where hopefully too many people weren't watching. Well, a lot of people are watching now and it's ESPN's <laughs> Chris Budden with us. I'm Brian Finley and anchor at Fox Sports Radio. How hard are you on yourself when it comes to judging your work? Um, I mean, I think we're all our own worst critics. Like I notice things like, oh, I took a breath in a, in, in this spot when I shouldn't have. I could have done this quite like we micro analyze everything, especially for sideline reporters, because you don't get that much time on air. And so you feel like every time you do, it has to be perfect. Now I'm to the point where I'm like, it, you know, there's things I can criticize myself and you, you might always be able to like change a way you worded a question. Uh, to me, it's like, if I ever mispronounce someone's name on air, like that stuff really hurts. Um, I know a mom's watching or, um, but you know, if I say, um, or if I take a breath where I shouldn't have, you know, I'm kind of, I've learned to, to be okay with that. I don't watch myself as much as I used to. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing because I still cringe watching myself. <laughs> um, I just have decided that time can be spent um, better use studying other people or studying other interviews than trying to break down every word that comes out of my mouth. What advice from your husband when it comes to your field do you listen to? Uh, not to be so hard on myself. It, he was, I mean, I, I will say like from the beginning, he has always been so much in my corner. Like we moved from Knoxville to San Diego for my job. He had a great job in LA, but we needed to be near family. Once we had kids, he up and left that. Um, but he finds the humor in it and he's able to make me laugh in times where, you know, like I thought it was the end of the world. Like I, I went to Boston for an interview and I thought that I got it. Like basically everyone at the station told me like, we're going to give you the job. And then two days later, I got a call from my agent and she said, the owner didn't like your look. What? And I'm, I'm on the couch crying hysterically. And my husband takes his phone and like puts it in my face and is like recording me. And I'm like, I want to stick my head in a garbage disposal. <laughs> like I thought it was the end of the world. And he took this video because he knew that I would rebound and find another job. And now we look back and we laugh and we think it's the funniest thing. And, you know, he sent it to my parents and my mom shows it to her friends. I'm like, you know, this is her when she was down in the dumps and, you know, two months later I get a call from Fox and it works out how it was, but he's able to take those moments where I'm so hard on myself and make a joke about it and kind of bring me back level-headed. Well, let's go to that moment because you were in Knoxville for six years. And then if I'm not mistaken, Chris, Fox came calling not too long after. So how did that engagement with Fox start? And then ultimately you getting on with them and then there's the Padres and, and other mm -hmm. properties within Fox. Yeah, it's funny. So like I interviewed for Fox six months before I got the job um, and didn't think I got it. Uh, Why I, didn't you think you got it? What, what was never it? never heard back. Sure. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and because they sent me home on an earlier flight. Like they flew me out to LA. 
I met with Jacob Ullman, who oversees their NFL. This was to do a sideline gig for um, Fox, NFL on Fox. And Jacob Ullman oversees it. And he's wonderful. And I thought like, it wasn't an audition. It was just like going out there to meet them. And I did. And like Jacob was like, okay, we're done. Um, what time's your flight? I was like six o'clock. He was like, oh, we're done. You can hop on an earlier flight. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I didn't hear back for a long time. And then I interviewed in Boston and I had a job offer in Nashville and I had a job offer in Atlanta for the exact same money that I was making in Knoxville. Oh. And Knoxville was going to promote me to be sports director. So at that point, I like had to make a decision. Do I just move to move? You know, I have these great connections in Knoxville. So I had verbally accepted the uh, sports director position at my station. And then Fox, lo and behold, calls <laughs> and they offered me, and this is what people don't realize when you move to like a regional or national sports network is it's not always a full-time job. They offered me 11 NFL games, which is not enough to live on for a year. And this is where, you know, I owe a huge debt to my husband. He was my fiance at the time. You know, he was, I was able to make that choice to say, you know, I'm going to try the Fox thing and see where it goes. Because financially he was in a place where he could support me if I didn't find anything else. I probably would have made the decision anyways because of my confidence in myself, but it, it made the, the move a lot more comfortable because I knew like I, I had a home, I, you know, I had a roof over my head if this doesn't go anywhere. Um, and I asked Knoxville if I could do both, but you know, NFL games are also on the weekends where they have Tennessee football games. And so that makes hard to do both. Sure. And so I did the NFL and the idea was to place me somewhere else within the Fox regional networks to make it more of a full-time gig. And that's when I got the call from San Diego and I interviewed there and got the job like two days I, this was now March. So it was like about to be spring training. I got the job with the Padres and they were like, okay, we need you out in spring training in a week. And I was like, okay, wow. well, I've never covered baseball from that intense of a perspective. Like I've done highlights and stuff, but, um, so then it became really diving into baseball and moving across the country. I was also, uh, I got the job in March. I was getting married in April Oh my goodness! Uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. So in my interview, I was like, can I have three days off to get married? <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I did. I took three days off to get married. And then I didn't see my then husband for another two months. <laughs> Gosh. And then, so when you were in San Diego, you obviously got to work with Dick Emberg. What's a cherished moment with Dick when it came to your work life that indicated just his classiness and his willingness to be so helpful to you in, in what he's done between you and him as far as working together at Fox? Uh, he would always take, whenever someone was new, he'd take them out to dinner, just you oh. and, um, and share, you know, Dick loved wine. And, um, and, and so we spent a dinner and me asking everything under the sun. And it's a shame because he, he was such a perfectionist that people didn't get to, I feel like on air, people didn't really get to know him, um, the personal side to him. And I'm so grateful that I did. Uh, I don't know how many people know this, but I had two baby showers for my son. One was held by my best friend here in Texas. The other one was held by Dick Emberg. Um, wow. Yeah. And uh, so he put that together with some of our coworkers um, out at his beach club. And I will ever be indebted to him for just what he taught me about a, the game of baseball, because it was such a passion of his. Um, and I, and I learned good and bad, like how perfectionist he was. He had always wanted to call a perfect game in his eyes and he never felt that he ever did. And so watching his work ethic, the way that he calls the games, it can be like poetry because that's the way that he sees it. And um, yeah, I, I remember being with him when he got the call that he was going into the hall of fame and oh. I had to interview him about going into the hall and what that moment meant to him because he was in so many other hall of fames but to be in the baseball hall of fame and win the ford c frick award um i remember when i was leaving san diego 
and he did like a goodbye tribute and my parents saved it because they were like the fact that he like told you how great you were on in and in, in front of this audience you know and here's the hall of famer and the respect that he has for you um so it's got I me mean, it was only two years but in baseball when you're on the road with people for 162 days you know you, you become family yeah no question and you certainly have a family when it comes to college football and college basketball broadcasting as well Working alongside Dickie V, what's something special? <laughs> what's something special about him that the general public doesn't know? Oh man! Um, so when when we're allowed to go on the road, Dick loves a good Italian meal, and so his <laughs> wife Lorraine comes with him every weekend. She is a joy, and we will sit there and have dinner for four hours. And we're sitting here, we're like, it's midnight. And we have a game, we're just, everyone's just talking for hours over Italian food. And um, he's the best storyteller. And he really, I mean, like, he, who he is on TV is who he is all the time. Um, but he's just a guy with a million stories. And it's really, it's, it's, he's also been a joy to get to, to spend time around. Dennis I actually been, called him Dick Emberg on air one time. I okay, so when I was <laughs> preparing, I I saw that. I hey, we all have our on air blips. Yeah, it happens, yeah. please. <laughs> I, yes, but I said I but, got my Hall of Famers mixed up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, and, and it won't be long until you're in that conversation as well. It's tennis for you. You were a two-time state champion in high school. Why didn't you pursue that further in college or, or push forward more? Well, first of all, if my husband's listening to this, he'll be so embarrassed because he was like, you're not that good. Uh, not <laughs> embarrassed than my husband good. I could have played like D2. Um, I, I was good enough to do that. But I also knew like, that's not what I, in order to, to make a career out of tennis, it involves um, a lot. Um, you almost have to be selfish in order to, to make a career out of tennis because you have to, it's all for you, you know, to make enough money to be able to pay for trainers and all this stuff. And so I knew that that's not what I wanted out of my career. So sure. again, this was the path and it was always going to be a reporter. So I did that, but I will say like tennis is how I met my husband. Um, so it's given me, uh, you know, I, I, it's given me so many friends. I always say like tennis is such a lifelong sport. Um, I play with my mom. Um, you know, I was taking tennis lessons in Knoxville and that's where, literally where I met my husband on a tennis court. So it's, it's always been intertwined in our family. How soon from the time you met him during that tennis lesson, did you realize that this is a special connection and that I could see spending the rest of my life with him? Well, for me, it was right away. It took him a <laughs> <laughs> no, We were friends for like a year and I knew that there was something special. Um, he had lived a very single life for a long time and I don't know, wanted to give it up. And then I like, eventually I just wore him down. And now, now he's like, you know, he's become like the ultimate family man. Like he didn't know if he ever wanted to get married and have kids. Like yesterday it was karate practice and t-ball practice. And he came home and he was like, this was such a good day. And I was like, oh, I didn't know if like 35 year old Mario would have thought that, but eventually I wore off on him. That's fantastic. And, and obviously building Legos and, and, and all that, <laughs> all that fun yeah. stuff, the joys of being a parent. My final question, Chris Budden with us, with ESPN, I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. Why do you get so much joy in helping others? I don't know. Um, it's something that I really noticed during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, you're stuck in your house and, um, you know, what you wake up every day, you, it becomes very monotonous. You have coffee, you make the kids this, you make the kids that, then you make dinner, like, where does your joy come from? And for a lot of time, like my joy came from work. Yeah. And that's not to say my kids don't bring me joy because they do. But for me, my joy comes from a lot of different things. And one of them was work and that got taken away. So then I had to self-evaluate of what else brings me joy. And that's, you know, that's when I realized that helping others was really one of the things that could fulfill that. 
And, and I think that that's also part of what my job is. Like I'm not helping people, but I'm sharing other people's stories. You know, I'm sure that this is why you, you know, love your podcast is because you love sharing other yeah. people's stories with the universe. And that's what I get out of my job. So when I couldn't do that, it was like, where's my interaction with the outside world and, and how can I help? So we raise money to buy food from local restaurants and bring them to the hospitals. Um, I've you know, gone out with Sunny Dyke's wife, um, Kate, and, and you know, helped with uh, clothing drives and stuff because I just realized like being able to do that stuff fills you know, it fills my cup in ways that, you know, I love helping my kids, but like, I feel like I can also do so much more outside of my own home. Um, and I have the time and the ability to do it like I couldn't before. Um, you know, when you have a social media following, you can raise money a little bit easier than when you don't. So how can I take this really superficial platform and use it to good? Um, and so that's what I tried to do during the pandemic. That's probably when I noticed that I really get a lot of joy out of it. I do it honestly, as much as I love helping others, I probably do it more for myself as well as I do for them. Chris Budden admired for so many things, philanthropy, her work in broadcasting, how she balances that with motherhood and also find some time to spend with her husband, Mario. Chris Budden, thank you so much with ESPN. I'm Brian Finley and Anchor at Fox Sports Radio. Really enjoyed spotlighting you. Thank you, Brian.